Hello, welcome to Christ Lutheran Church online worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am Pastor Brian Mallison, and I'm so glad that you joined us. We continue our November worship series, Enough is Enough. This certainly have been the sentiments of many in these challenging times, but we are reminded that God is with us and as such fills our needs and our cares for our well-being. But what about others? How does God care for those who are in great need? Well, today's message is entitled, Enough for All. Welcome. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hello, my name is Lauren Chambers. I am a worship leader here at Christ Lutheran Church in Visalia, California. I'm very happy that you've decided to join us for worship on this Sunday before Thanksgiving. We're so glad that we can gather together in spirit, being distanced but not separated during this time. We begin our worship by acknowledging our human inclination towards sin and selfishness, and in humility seek forgiveness from a God who promises mercy and reconciliation. Please join me in prayer. Merciful God, we come before you in confession with heavy hearts because we know that our actions and inactions have hurt you and your creation. We are sorry for the times in which we have been selfish and taken more than our fair share. We are sorry for the times we have been unfeeling and unsympathetic towards those in need. We are sorry for the times when we have acted out of frustration and anger. We are sorry for the times we have put others in danger through our carelessness. We are sorry for the times we have tried to take matters into our own hands instead of giving everything to you, Lord. We are sorry, but we are grateful. We are grateful because you are gracious, God. We offer you our imperfect apologies and you grant us your complete and perfect forgiveness. Please help us to continue to live as forgiven people, seeking your will in our lives. In your name we pray, amen. As a fellow sinner and recipient of God's grace and mercy, I grant to you the total and complete forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mustin, and a Kairos moment that I had was when I had a conversation with this student, and distance learning has been a challenge for most, but I've seen some highlights here and there of um, students being able to express themselves and maybe not feel the social anxiety that they had felt before in the classroom. And I keep open just a regular Zoom so that they can come in before we have class and ask any questions or do study hall or just hang out with someone if there's no one home. And I had a student respond to the chat box, which was, what is your favorite movie? And she goes, actually, I have a new TV show. And I said, oh, okay, well, what's your TV show? And she goes, um, she said the name of the show that I honestly can't remember right now, but she goes, you know why I like it? And I said, why? And she goes, it has a LGBTQ character. And then she paused, like she was waiting for me to respond. I said, oh, that's awesome. What else do you like about it? And she just kind of sat up and she goes, oh. And she started telling me all these things that she liked about the show. And then she goes, there's someone like me on TV. And I just stopped and I was like, I'm so glad that you found something you really like. And in my head, I was just thinking that she felt so comfortable when I've never met this student face to face enough to tell me that. And I don't know if she has an outlet at home to tell anybody at home that, but I don't think she could have had that conversation in the classroom. And so that was my Kairos moment of just thinking, okay, some kids are doing okay. And we have the ability to still help them and support them even through a webcam.
The scripture reading today is Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7 through 11. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community, in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking, the seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and begrudgingly when you do so. For on this account, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your need that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Here ends the reading. I would like to read one additional passage. This comes from St. Luke, the 19th chapter. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down from the tree and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he is gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This story about Zacchaeus meeting Jesus has always been one of my favorites. I remember back to uh, my early days in Lutheran theological education when Miss Brown taught my second grade Sunday school class and used a, a flannel board to tell the story of Zacchaeus. And as a kid, what stood out in my mind was that uh, Jesus picked him out of the crowd to have dinner with. But now that I'm a little bit older, what stands out for me is Zacchaeus's response. I will give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone, and as a tax collector, you know that he did, I'll pay back four times the amount. Wow. Have you ever met anyone so generous? And so today, I'd, I'd like to talk about Money. Now, I, I know this isn't a popular topic in the church. So listen, if you want to fast forward through the service and get to the end, I'll understand. But I don't know how you can read the Bible, especially the gospel stories about Jesus, and not wrestle with the reality that money is an important spiritual issue. <laughs> I'm reminded of the joke you've probably heard before, but... The church board comes to the pastor and says, sorry, there will be no raise for next year. And the pastor said, but, 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 I'm, a, but I'm a poor preacher. And the church board said, yeah, we know. We um, listen to you every Sunday. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about money. We, um, we live in a society that is kind of broken down into essentially three economic tiers. There's the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class. And you might be thinking right now which class you're in. But in Jesus' day, there were really only two classes, the upper class and the lower class. Now, the, the upper class were the, the landowners. The lower class were the peasants. And roughly 90% of the population were peasants. Do you want to guess which class Jesus belonged to? The lower. And think about the peasants for a moment. They lived at the mercy of the upper class, of weather, of famine, of pestilence, of bandits, of war. They lived what hand to mouth or as often was the case, nothing in the hand to the mouth. 
And there's always a ranking system, even, even among the lower class. I mean, just like junior high school kids that compare themselves to one another and place themselves in higher or lower categories, so also among the lower class in Jesus' day. At the top of the lower class were, well, people who had jobs like craftsmen and farmers and fishermen. And the lower on the ladder were day laborers. And then lower were people who were indentured to others or slaves. And then even lower were the outcasts, the, the vagabonds, the beggars, the lepers. Do you remember that early in Jesus' ministry, he was tempted by Satan in the desert? One of the temptations he faced was to turn stones into bread. Now, I always thought that this was a temptation just to have Jesus eat something since he's been fasting for 40 days. But it was really more than that. Here is what the temptation was truly about. Feed the masses. Become the economic and nutritional support for the peasants. L lift them up from their poverty. Right the injustices that have been done to them by the upper class. I mean, if Jesus could somehow be in control of a food distribution program, then he could help that 90% gain not only nutrition, well, but also strength and encouragement and, and hope. And maybe they would be able to do something for themselves and throw off the poverty that's shackled them. Well, that sounds fine and all, but well, what happens when the miracle worker is gone, is dead? Well, well, then it all goes away. It stops. I'm leading a Bible study on Thursday nights called Theology on Tap. And uh, in this Bible study right now, we're, we're reading and studying the Sermon on the Mount. And it's my contention that this sermon lays out not only the purpose of Jesus in his ministry, but details what it looks like for someone who wants to live inside the kingdom of God. You ought to join us. It's open to anyone. But anyway, one of the things we're seeing in the Sermon of the Mount is how Jesus isn't interested in social programs or improving the religious systems. Jesus has something better in mind. Jesus wants to change the hearts of those who would follow him. He, he wants to make it so that, that he would live in the hearts of his followers. Jesus wants to inspire his followers to live in a way that, that they take what he teaches them and they begin to do it. <laughs> you see, Jesus wishes to be not the provider of bread, but the bread of life in you. Now, all of a sudden, I need to start listening to what Jesus thinks about economics. And he says some pretty wild things. I mean, he blesses the poor. He gives priority to the disadvantaged. And he challenges the wealthy. Jesus seems to have a heart for those who don't have much money or much power or much dignity or much hope. And if you, like me, have some of those things, or, or maybe all of those things, well, then it starts to get hard. See, I, I told you this was going to be a, a tough message today. And it, it, listen, if you want to fast forward to the end, I understand. But I hope you stick with me. So, so let me go on. Here's a question. How do revolutions generally start? How do uprisings happen? Usually from the people being oppressed or put down. I mean, those without power take to the streets, maybe organize a movement, maybe even arm themselves with guns and bombs. But the problem we've seen is that often violent revolutions result in a new class of oppressive rulers. As the Who sang so many years ago, 
Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. But Jesus has a different approach. I'm rereading a book that has been out for a little while entitled The Upside Down Kingdom. I highly recommend it. The author, Donald Craybill, reminds us that the way of Jesus, the essence of the kingdom of God that Jesus came to usher into reality is almost always quite the opposite of how our culture works. So as I mentioned earlier, Jesus says to the poor that they're blessed, not, not the wealthy. Jesus lifts up children as the epitome of who is in the kingdom, not the politically powerful. Jesus says that a, a leader is one who serves, not one who imposes his or her will over others. So also, when it comes to social revolution, rather than be a call to the lower class to rise up, his invitation is to the upper class to give a hand up. Have you noticed all the times Jesus talks about compassion and charity and giving? Have you noticed how the central theme seems to be of grace in his message? He, he isn't directing these words to those who are without compassion or without means or without money. No, he's talking to those who have the capacity to be compassionate, of those with resources, of those with financial well-being. His desire is to change the hearts of the upper class in order to reach down to the lower class and to pull them up. And so I recognize that, by and large, the audience that I speak to in my context of Christ Lutheran Church are people with some level of means. And I know that there are some who are quite comfortable, and I know that there are some who are barely making it. But largely the people I connect with are, are somewhere between the upper class and the lower class in our culture. And I wonder, does our faith influence our pocketbook? Or does our relative wealth influence our convictions. Let me say that again. Does our faith influence our pocketbook? Or does our relative wealth influence our convictions? I don't know if there's a more troubling question to ask, because let's face it, money and stuff and possessions and social influence, it all means something. But please hear me clearly. It isn't that money or stuff or social influence is bad. It, it isn't. The question is, what are you going to do with it? And gosh, I mean, this gets challenging. I mean, I told you, you should have fast forwarded through the message today, but this is really important because it leads to other questions of, of how it might hit home for you. I mean, for instance, is what you have because you earned it or because God gifted it to you? Well, with Christmas coming, are you thinking more about the gifts you need to buy for those you know or how much you can give to those you don't personally know but you know exist in need? When buying clothes, are you conscious about clothes made in sweatshops in third world countries, or do you just never look at the labels? Is your stock portfolio invested in companies that pay unfair wages or are involved in unethical business practices, or do you carefully select socially conscious investments? When you look at your credit card statements or your the debits that you make from your checking account. How, how much do you keep or spend on yourself? And how much goes to do God's work of helping others? You see, these are questions that are directed at people with means, with resources, with 
capacity to help. And I am compelled to believe that God has a vision for our world that well, it's better than my vision for the world, B better than what our history books or political science books teach, <clears throat> better than any political leader or political party has promised, and better than any image of success and well-being that Hollywood or Madison Avenue have ever presented. And that vision is consistent from the beginning of God's call upon Israel back in the book of Deuteronomy and carries forth into the ministry of Jesus, and it is a vision of enough for all. And it rests upon our willingness to see it into reality. So how do you hear this today? What do we do with this? Well, again, I believe Jesus seeks to change your heart, not by force, but by love. I mean, he saw Zacchaeus sitting in that tree. He knew who Zacchaeus was and the selfish things that he had done. And he didn't scold Zacchaeus and he didn't shame him. He simply called him down and made a place for himself in Zacchaeus' life. And Zacchaeus heard this, and he had his heart changed. He embraced the upside-down image of God's kingdom. He became something he wasn't before, as a person who was a have, as a person with means. He committed himself to give abundantly and radically. I gotta tell you, I know some Zacchaeuses in the world, and there are many Zacchaeuses in this church, and I'm learning from them. God bless the Zacchaeuses of this world who have chosen to live upside down. They've taken on the character of Jesus and brought hope and compassion and grace to those who don't have it. They have decidedly taken what influence they have and made life better for others who live without. They have feasted on the bread of life so that bread might be shared with those who are hungry. I think our world needs a bunch of Zacchaeuses. And I don't know about you, but I want to become one of them. Amen. So 
Lord Jesus, we come before you in prayer with so much gratitude for all you have given us. We have set aside this time of year as a time specifically meant for giving thanks, and we truly are thankful for what we have. We are thankful for the many types of technology which allow us to stay connected to friends and family during these times of physical distancing. We are thankful for the doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals who continue to care for those who have been affected by COVID-19. We are thankful for the scientists who are tirelessly working on vaccines and means of distribution. We are thankful for this faith community that continues to prioritize loving like Jesus, even when it is difficult. Gracious God, we lift up to you the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday. We pray that though traditions for many may be very different this year, the spirit of the holiday will remain. We pray for people who are facing holidays alone this year and ask that you send your spirit of care upon them. Lord, we ask that you grant discernment to those who are contemplating travel or inviting visitors for this holiday season. Let all that we do be done out of selfless love for others. Lord, that we ask that you bless all who gather, whether around Thanksgiving tables or family Zoom calls, so that all may stay safe and healthy for many holidays to come. For all this and so much more, we pray in your son's holy name, Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, again, welcome to Christ Lutheran Church. I have many announcements for our church today, so I invite you to pay close attention because I think they're each very important. As you are aware, we will not be able to gather for our annual Thanksgiving Eve worship service this Wednesday evening, but we have put together a very special Thanksgiving video that will go out to you through, well, YouTube and our Facebook, and it'll be taking place uh, this Wednesday, so you can get on any time uh, from Wednesday from 6 o'clock on. It's entitled The Great Christ Lutheran Thanksgiving Baking Show. It will offer wonderful music, some scripture reading, some prayer, and even a baking tip. You know, you're not going to want to miss this. You can watch it over and over throughout the weekend and share it with your friends as well. Secondly, Christ Lutheran Church will be inviting you to make a financial pledge for 2021, which is our 60th year in ministry. Our members will be receiving in the mail a pledge card for 2021, and we ask that you would return it to the church by way of mail the week of December 7th through the 13th. We will be offering a very special prayer on December 13th worship for the pledges that have been made. So watch for those pledge cards coming to you and be in prayer as you reflect upon your financial support for the year to come. And then on Sunday, December 6th at 9.30 in the morning, there will be a very special budget forum that will be on Zoom 
for our church members. The 2021 budgets are coming to our members in the mail in the week to come, so please watch for them. And then join the Zoom or call into the church office if you have questions and wish further understanding. And then on December 13th, we're going to attempt to do something very challenging. We're going to have a congregational meeting. Now, this will take place at 10 a.m. And there will be three ways that you can join. One way is to come to the church campus. Weather permitting, we will meet in the plaza, socially distancing and wearing face masks. You may also join by way of Zoom. A Zoom connection will be sent to our members through the weekly e-blast. Or you can call onto a conference call. We have important responsibilities in this meeting of approving our leadership on church boards and commissions and approving the prayer team and considering the 2021 budget for approval. And finally, in a little over a week, we move into the season of Advent. In addition to the regularly scheduled Sunday worship online experiences, we will be offering a weekday gathering entitled Weight Lifting. Now, notice that it is spelled W-A-I-T as we are all waiting. And waiting isn't easy, and we need to lift one another up as God lifts each of us up as well in these odd and challenging times. You are invited to join a conversation and a learning experience on Mondays, beginning November 30th at 7 in the evening. The Zoom contact information will be posted on the eblast, or you can call the church office to get that information. Now, our first gathering on Monday, November 30th, will be led by Lutheran pastor and licensed marriage and family therapist, Christine Ruth. She is going to lead a conversation on the aspect of grief in the waiting process. You will want to join this conversation. It could literally change your life. Many things are happening in your church. Be in prayer, asking where God is leading you to participate in the ministry that we share together, even in these COVID times. And as God speaks into your life, be obedient and follow God's leading. Thank you.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.